Being a mech warrior in Battletech is one of the greatest occupations imaginable, but one that comes with the very, very real chance of burning out your brain, dying young and violently, or worse, living crippled beyond repair without an heir. To be a mech warrior is to be society's new man, to be different, to be more, to be better than the average person they put in shadow as they walk past. They live lives of adventure, glory, and life-threatening, pulse-pounding, adrenaline-fueled mortal combat, but most people don't really know what it's like being a mech warrior. They don't know about the utter misery that piloting a battle mech actually is, and they don't know how difficult life can and often will be for mech warriors, and they certainly don't know or understand how common destitution and failure are. But despite it all, being a mech warrior is one heck of a ride, and I'm going to explain everything from how someone becomes a mech warrior to what kind of gear the pilot uses, and how a mech warrior becomes something more than human once they enter their machine. So if that interests you, stick around, we've got many things to cover and many memes to share. Not the clans though, this is a very inner sphere focused video since the clans are weird and icky and dumb and they can go be off in their own video somewhere else well beyond inner sphere territory, just like they should have stayed in the lore. But first, introductions. Welcome to Science Insanity, a channel dedicated to bringing my love of sci-fi and all its glory to you, the viewer. I'm a professional idiot, part-time turbo nerd, and hopefully I can entertain you for a little bit and earn that like or subscribe by the end. As for the actual content, let's get started with something simple and easy. How do you actually become a mech warrior? What's the enlistment like? What's the training like? What's the early life like? Do you get severance? Dental coverage? Well, to put it simply, it depends on who's teaching you where and why. First thing I want to immediately punt into the nearest sun is the idea you'll be brought up by a group like the Northwind Highlanders or Grey Death Legion or the main characters in all the Mech Warrior games. You will not be those guys. Even in the setting, those guys are insane and over the top. What's almost guaranteed is you're either enlisted and heading off to war college or you're getting your parents' skills and kills passed down to you. The first option, you're going to need to be tenuously middle class and of the correct type of citizen. In some rare cases though, your upbringing could involve piloting industrial or agricultural mechs, so you'll have some pre-existing aptitude with it, and you can convince someone from a higher nobility to sponsor you, as we see in the book trilogy Rogue Academy, where some orphans after a combine attack get sponsored into a program. For the most part, the successor states rely on a sort of low nobility filling out most of their ranks of mech warriors because of how expensive and important the actual mechs are. They don't want any random peasant piloting them, they want people actually invested in the society. Except the Federated Sons, sorta, that's actually pretty close to real life where you can apply, go through basic grunt school, prove you have the chops, and test your way into war college to become a mech warrior but you'll always be at a disadvantage compared to the nobles with connections and friends in high places. But regardless of how you do it, if you go this route, you're guaranteed to get decent training. You'll spend years being drilled hard, uh, phrasing, you'll spend years practicing hard and learning the basics of everything from mech operations to tactics and strategy in a fight. One thing I should note is that this is a bit of a genetic coin flip. In order to use a battle mech, you need to be able to interface with a neuro helmet. Everyone can use one, but most people get really sick or disoriented. If your parents are mech warriors, you're pretty much guaranteed to be compatible as well. But once you've graduated from whatever war machine school you went to, then you're in for years of sweet fuck all. Here's the thing. There's a saying in Battletech. It goes along the lines of kill the meat to save the metal. And that's basically saying, merc the dipshit in the cockpit to save the machine he's in. A battle mech is very much so more valuable than your life, so what's most likely to happen as a newbie is you're going to be shipped off to some garrison where you get to pilot a mech for a few hours a month to keep your basic qualifications until a war starts. And once a war starts, because this is battle tech, not peace tech, it will, you get shipped off to the front as reserve, waiting for a chance to get into battle and prove yourself. You might then ask, why? Why not put new mech warriors in, like, light mechs or something, and then bulk out the front lines. And I reiterate, mechs are more valuable than people because people can be replaced and mechs often outright cannot. And we don't exactly have a huge number of mechs lying around, Comstar makes well and truly sure of that. The veterans get the good stuff, the heroes get the powerful stuff, and mech warriors don't part from their mechs or a unit without dying first. You, dear Greenhorn, get the old, light, dodgy-legged mechs in reserve and will spend your time guarding convoys, doing backline patrols, and rushing to hurry up and wait. 
Ideally, a bunch of people kick it during a breakthrough and you're part of the group that stops it. Hooray! Command pushes you up and you're now in the bigger toys on the front lines, stomping about. You're on the front lines. Yay. And this is really how it goes for the average nobody. You work hard, bust your ass, come out ahead of all your peers, and then get kicked right back down to the bottom of the shit heap since having disposable mech warriors on hand is about as common and useful as spare parts and ammo. It's important to mention that a lot of mercenaries and pirates come from these people, highly trained, good at killing, but stuck doing dick all in the military. Just like real life. So one day, they're on mission, they turn off their transponder, and just walk away with the mech to go join some mercenaries or something. Or, once they're finished their service, they look for work with merc outfits as a pre-trained, willing mech warrior for hire. And hey, this way, even if it is a shitty light mech with a borked leg, at least it's yours now. As for the other possibility, well, you're born into it. This is pirates, mercenaries, and noble houses. While the common grunts and low nobles end up having a bad time of things from the glory and adventure angle, important nobles often have legacies to uphold and generational mechs that have been passed down for centuries. A proper noble family might have multiple, so if you're the little lordling then you'll be brought up from an early age and trained to take over that position. You'll also receive cushy postings in any actual battles that keep you relatively safe, or you'll be fast-tracked through officer school to get your own command relatively quickly. Mercenaries are also possible, though even more rare than nobles, surprisingly enough, since most mercenaries don't live long enough to have kids, and those that do are often main character levels of plot armored. Being the kid to a successful merc means learning everything they did and taking on all their skills and tricks to survive the trade. By the time you're ready to head out into the field, you'll be more than practiced and knowledgeable than most other newbie mech warriors in the setting by necessity. Since canonically, mercs die like flies, average of 3-5 to five months life expectancy. And then we get to pirates, periphery soldiers, and random planetary militias. Look, I'm gonna be real with you, you're not making it back alive from your first battle, you're probably not even trained to do more than walk and shoot badly, and you're probably piloting a 500 year old busted up shit heap that hasn't been properly repaired in twice as long. The reality is, most of these areas are not going to have the resources, pilots, experience, or training to properly raise you to be a really competent mech warrior. The best you're going to get is the methods and tactics used by the person who trained you, and those are going to be biased, incomplete, and skewed to whatever their experience has been. You'll get the basics down, sure, but you're going to need to learn what you can when you can through experience during your occasional run-ins with other poorly equipped raiders, pirates, or militia groups. If you end up going against proper successful mercs, great house militaries and the like, you are boned. Write your obituary because you are not coming home. The mechs you'll use and the training you'll have are broken and minimal, respectively. And those are really your only choices and chances of getting into the cockpit of a mech. The setting is biased towards the cool and successful because that's what you normally read about in the books, but for the average, being a mech warrior is a pretty meh to awful existence. What you're not shown is that the vast, vast majority of mech warriors accomplish very little, don't make much money, and if they try to strike out on their own, end up destitute and back where they started after a few months, if not dead. But that's the how of becoming a mech warrior. Let's cover the why and start talking about what it's like in the hot seat. Starting with the combat attire and gear. What do the mech warriors wear in the cockpit? What's their gear like? What's the experience like in the seat? And why do so many people aspire to be this kind of soldier? Well, over the course of the setting's development, we've seen everything from the primitive neuro helmet sitting like a microwave on the pilot's shoulder, to the edgy, sexy era where mech warriors are scantily clad and muscular, to the more modern depictions where combat suits and neuro helmets are like current day fighter pilot G suits. And to my immense pleasure, they're all technically canon, all correct. But the sexy booty shorts and often very little on top is the most common and widespread. And you might then ask Sai, what the hell, why? These are soldiers, aren't they? Why are they dressed like something off the horny side of the internet? And before you dismiss this as something that's just there for fan service, like the cover of Sorensen's Sabres, it goes both ways. Men and women and everything in between. It's just as common to see a woman climb out of the cockpit in a bikini as it is to see a dude freebagging it in the buff after a battle. And the simple reason is that the mech cockpits are sweltering hothouse hellholes when things get rough. 
The cooling and heat sinks of a mech can only do so much. Some heat is going to conduct its way through the chassis up to the cockpit, and once there, it's really hard to get rid of. So mech warriors, especially if they're in combat dumping alpha strikes and pushing the machine to a full sprint, are going to be running hot. Mech warriors wear combat suits, jackets, or coats over top of their tidy whiteies, but many, if not most of them, ditch that once they're in the solitude of their machine. And if you ask your local mech tech to install some cooling systems to manage the heat in the cockpit, they're going to charge you an arm and a leg to get that stuff working, and then you might need to sacrifice armor and electronics around the cockpit to fit it in. Things are very cramped, after all. Ask a seasoned mech warrior what to do, and they'll just tell you to drop trouser and spread your legs to get some circulation going, as God intended. As the timeline progresses in the setting, we see more of the advanced combat suits and stuff show up, but, you know, they're still very rare. As for the neuro helmets, the other notable thing, and often only thing, that mech warriors are wearing, well, the more advanced ones are just helmets. Eat your heart out, sci-fi artists, because you can do whatever you want. But for the more primitive ones, lovably nicknamed Coneheads by the community, also the most common ones, the Neuro Helmet is heavy, bulky, and restrictive. You can't turn your head at all, and the weight is so much that on long patrols they were known to cause soreness, stiffness, and in many cases bruising. Worse is that, like I mentioned, the space is incredibly cramped by necessity. So you don't have much room to move, you can't stand up or stretch, and if you need to relieve yourself, well, uh, let me put it like this. Most mechs have a little toilet or waste disposal thing in the cockpit, but it's so finicky, so uncomfortable, and so cramped that it's like trying to shimmy your butt over the center console of your car to unload into the passenger seat while still driving. Not a fun experience, especially when patrols can last the better part of 12 hours and real battles can drag for days with only minor breaks in between for eating and sleeping. So what's it like to actually pilot a mech? Profoundly uncomfortable. By the time a mech warrior gets out of the mech, they're usually exhausted, sore, filthy, and in a very bad mood. So if every single day in one of these things is a veritable decade of customer service work cramped down into eight hours, why would anyone ever want to do this? Why would mech warriors be seen as and feel like battlefield royalty? Well, this is where the good bits start, and leads to part two of the Neuro Helmet. A lot of people think this is some heads-up display or used to help the mech balance by working off the pilot's sense of balance, but it's so much more than that. The Neuro Helmet is essentially an adapter, meant to convert mechanical and electrical data into human neurological signals and vice versa. The helmet projects a visual display for the pilot with all relevant information, of course, but the really profound part is that it beams information directly into the pilot's brain. A mech warrior can see, in a way, through the mech's cameras, hear through its sensors and speakers, feel the movement of limbs and the thunking of ammo feed belts. All the data the mech has is converted into sensation and feelings for the pilot, even to a degree things like emotions, as the pilot's feelings can affect how a mech reacts. If someone is calm or upbeat then swings their fist in a jab, then it might just make the mech lazily swing its arm in a look over there gesture. But if the pilot is wired, pissed, and afraid mid-combat, the same motion triggers the aggression and violence centers and the computer will read that, then throw a haymaker and rip the head off another machine. The Neuro Helmet essentially translates human brain into mech computer and vice versa. The more advanced ones are so capable of this that during the Star League era, pilots could shutter the cockpit, blind themselves, and then with nothing to rely on but the mech sensors, do just as well piloting it as before in the heat of combat, letting the mech become an extension of all of their senses. Though this had a negative effect. The human brain isn't meant to handle that kind of data flow or the neuro helmet stimulating their brain like that for very long, and mech warriors could find themselves being slowly lobotomized as their neuro helmet cooks the brain. And while that may at first seem like another negative, in reality it's a transcendent experience. You become your mech. You aren't some random fleshy bag of mostly water, you're a mech warrior. You tower above regular men, even above tanks and buildings. You can run and strafe and move and gesture like a person while piloting your massive war machine. You can shrug off incredible damage and put down even more. And with the Neuralink sending you feedback, you feel, in a way, all the damage you take. You feel the rush as adrenaline floods you when the targeting computer confirms a solid hit on the enemy. That 
That is what mech warriors live for, and why so many are willing to put up with hell to get even a taste of this. Because when a mech warrior is sitting behind the proverbial wheel, when they've got an enemy in their sights and they pull the trigger, it's an experience unlike anything anyone else could even begin to understand. In most societies, you also earn the adoration and respect of the people under and around you, literally in the case of the ground pounders. A mech showing up as support is enough to turn even the most determined of armored or infantry assaults right around. There are countless examples of even a single mech showing up and turning the tide of a small engagement. They also engage in the heaviest, most vicious fighting in the setting. So mech warriors cultivate a sort of larger-than-life fame to them, the way that marines or special forces would in real life, only to an even greater degree. Being a mech warrior means having a level of prestige, respect, and societal position that most people will never achieve. You get a hell of a bonus to your charisma since let's be real, mech warriors are powerful, dangerous, often but not always, wealthy people. Or at least that's the image others have. So boy oh boy do you get a bonus to your seduction rolls. Being a mech warrior is also a very live fast or die young sort of profession where most mech warriors are more than willing to put themselves at risk of death in search of glory, and most will die, but the chance of striking it big and the rewards that it brings are immeasurable. There are mercenary outfits that built themselves up from nothing and now own entire planets in the setting. That is very much so something people are willing to risk. And the last major aspect of what it's like to be a mech warrior is the downtime. The afterwards, the post-mission decompress, the after-action experience. And I'm gonna be honest, it's vulgar and rude. But mech warriors do... Oh god, do they do a lot of fighting, fucking finagling, and working out. The rush of emotions, the incredible strain on the body and mind, all of that stuff I talked about earlier when the mech warrior gets out of the cockpit, those emotions and that stress has to go somewhere. And mech warriors tend to develop uh, eccentricities and codependencies in how they handle themselves. Mech warrior starting fights is fairly common. High stress, life threatening situations, it's inevitable that those tensions boil over into throwing hands. Rarely do things get out of control and it's taken seriously through discipline, but having two mech warriors throw a punch or two coupled with copious curses is depressingly common. The other common option is, well, getting it on. Mech warriors are men and women and discrimination is surprisingly light because as it turns out, shooting someone with a gun the size of a car is a gender neutral form of employment. Who would have thunk it? But yes, it is extremely common for mech warriors to burn through condoms together faster than they burn through ammo. It's an easy way to release stress, put yourself in a good mood, and waste time between missions. Joke about that all you will, by the way, you've got my permission to make every possible joke in the comments, and yes, before you ask, I'm gonna beat you all to it. The cockpit very much lives up to its name, often enough to make a seasoned mech tech consider deep throating a 12 gauge when they have to clean it up. The finagling part. Now this is a little weird, the reality is most mech warriors take up hobbies, and while I could have just called it that, I wanted the triple F. Compared to piloting a battle mech, most other things seem pretty boring, so a lot of mech warriors will take on things like cooking ridiculous over-the-top meals, brewing their own beer, collecting rare valuable artifacts and stuff Snord says hello, artistic endeavors like painting, ridiculous obsessions with video games or movies in-universe, and all kinds of other stuff like that. In general, this is done by wealthier mech warriors or mercenaries who have the free time and more lax structure compared to soldiers, but it's common for all mech warriors to adopt some kind of strange hobby or pastime or whatever to keep themselves sane, just doing things to keep busy. One thing you will be doing lots of no matter where, how, or who you are when you become a mech warrior is working out. Piloting a mech is both a strenuous mental and physical exercise, so mech warriors by necessity, regardless of where they're from, tend to be in very good shape and tend to be pretty mentally quick as well. Long hours of exercising, practicing tactics and strategy, discussing tactics and all of that stuff, even doing things like playing mind games, chess and whatever, very common. And that brings us to the end. Finally answering the question, what is it like? to be a mech warrior. And the reality is, overall, a very taxing, uncomfortable, and often painful life. 
a life that's almost destined to end violently for the vast majority of them and quickly, and a life filled with so many pitfalls, threats, and problems that you'll never really be settled or safe. But being a mech warrior also means a level of prestige, fame, and social power that few other people ever get to enjoy in the setting. You're like a rock star who plays weapons instead of instruments and sells death instead of records. You're going to live fast, live gloriously, and most likely, you're going to die young and violently after one hell of a ride. But if you're good, really good, that's when legends are born. You spend years, decades even, kicking ass, taking names, fighting the best of the best and making yourself known before packing it in whenever you decide to raise your kids, relax with your riches, or enjoy your status as a war hero. And that pretty much concludes this video. Really, I just wanted an excuse to talk about a whole bunch of different aspects of what being a mech warrior is like, but I couldn't figure out how to stretch them into full videos because they're like six minute segments by themselves. So get played, idiots, you got clickbaited into something entirely irrelevant. Though if anyone's interested, I could make a number of shorter videos talking about each segment or something. Maybe make them like 10 minute stretched videos on specific things like a neuro helmet, training to pilot a mech, what it's like, maybe even the ghost stories in the setting, because there are a few of those, there are phantom mechs running around as well. But regardless, if you've made it this far, you're definitely the target audience, so why not leave a like, subscribe, comment, ring the bell, all that stuff. It helps the channel out and tells YouTube to tell you whenever new videos are published. And if you're feeling extra generous, Sai has a Patreon where you can donate to my Staying Alive Fund. And speaking of patrons, a huge thanks to all the people going above and beyond. Whether it be the arms dealer donating all of the tools and toys you saw in today's video for on-hand and on-demand testing, whether it be the food merchants making sure that I am well-fed at all times, or whether it be the coffee vendors making sure that my war on sleep is forever supported because by god one day I will never sleep again. And a special thanks to the new guys who joined up. Thank you very much Lars Tietenberg and Demo05. And to all patrons overall, you guys are great. I really appreciate your generosity. Before I actually end off the video, though, I do have an announcement to make for everybody that made it this far. Saturday the 25th, starting at, like, 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, or UTC minus four time zone, I'm going to be streaming live on Twitch. We're going to be playing Fallout by popular request from a couple people in the Discord server. And we're going we're gonna to try, we're going to try playing the first Fallout game and trying to wield that absolute dinosaur of a game into something playable. So if you're interested in that, check it out. And if things go well, who knows, maybe I'll start streaming regularly again. And with that, I got nothing else to say. Video is over. Goodbye!